And so here we have Moller, right? Now let's kind of transition to uh, our second author and tell us how does she see it differently? Yeah, so Dr. Kelly Hamrin uh, is in in, again, is in a totally different boat. Uh, she is a professor at Liberty University, so she is still technically considered evangelical, right? She still kind of holds on to similar tenets that, that Moeller does, uh, but she has her PhD specifically in English, and she's looked a lot on 20th century Russian literature, uh, out of which things like Marxism really flow and kind of get picked on, uh, picked right. up later by people in uh, that part of the world. And so uh, we thought it would be important kind of going forward to just give you two very simple definitions of the words Marxism and critical race theory. Uh, and so they're basically this. Marxism is the political and economic theories of Karl Marx, surprise, surprise, uh, and Frederick Engels, uh, later developed by their followers to form the basis for the theory and practice of bum 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 communism, right? <laughs> uh, that dastardly thing that America has uh, sought to fight all through the 20th century. Uh, and then the second thing, critical race theory, is a combination of studies in history and law to, that try to look at how our justice system may be inclined to disfavor people of color. So when we look at some of her premises and conclusions that she draws, it's pretty much what we, what we talked about earlier, right? The idea here is that Black Lives Matter, both as a slogan and a movement, is not simply just an atheistic Marxist movement uh, that is anti-God in the way that it plays out pragmatically, right? We have plenty of Jesus-following black brothers and sisters who are affirming the movement and the sentence, Black Lives Matter. And this is a thing that we have to pay attention to because if we want to be uh, critical thinkers, right, she'll argue, that we have to be able to not throw the baby out with the bathwater and nuance things well. So nuance is really the underlying assumption here that she tries to present throughout the totality uh, of the article that she writes. And I think that these are actually the biggest pros and the strengths of her premises. The nuance, the ability to kind of uh, read in between the lines and see where things are good uh, and leave the bad, right? Kind of eating the chicken and spitting out the bones mm -hmm. as it were. Uh, another thing that she does really well is kind of highlighting that BLM is not just a liberal boogeyman. And, and this is what I'm seeing uh, from our more conservative evangelical friends on that side of the aisle is there's kind of this propensity to uh, inadvertently demonize a lot of the BLM movement because of these two weird things that not a lot of people, I'm willing to bet, know too much about regarding Marxism, uh, Marxism and critical race theory, right? Uh, and then probably my favorite thing that she does in this is she actually points out some good truths in Marxism. Now, this is not because I'm a Marxist. I am not. So if you're watching this, I'm neither a Marxist nor am I a communist, right? Like, I'm just going to say that again. I'm not a Marxist, nor am I a communist. But here's what I do believe. All truth belongs to God, right? And so because all truth is God's truth, we're going to come across things uh, in other systems of belief that are indeed true. I don't feel like that's too much of a stretch. And so when you are talking about earlier that we can acknowledge things from people that are outside of the Christian faith, not only does that make us stronger in our belief set, in our systems, in our values, and not only does it give us a better than truncated worldview, it allows us to be able to meet people where they're at and form better, genuine, and more holistic relationships. Uh, so the two things that she says that I think are critically important, the first one is that, and this, these come from Marxism, by the way, uh, power does exist and people do sometimes use it to oppress others. Mm. And the second thing is that oppressed people do suffer, and oftentimes their suffering is unjust. Okay? Does this sound like any religious figure that you or I follow who might have said this some 2,000-ish years before Karl Marx lived? Yeah, totally interesting. It takes us back to the New Testament. Yeah, right? right? And then this... I know you're an Old Testament guy, but there's, <laughs> there's still some value in the New Testament as well. Oh, old. definitely, definitely. <laughs> and so, so that's, that's really interesting, right? Because the... The posture initially of the conversation isn't necessarily, do I have to convince you of my fundamental beliefs or do I have to forfeit right. my fundamental beliefs? Right. It seems rather I'm willing to hear the specific issues that are going on and how to act accordingly towards them. And I think that's where the crux of the, the disagreement is. Yes, right? Yes, 100%. Like, to what degree is racism actually plaguing our society and to what degree should we do anything about it? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think she's really kind of pushing here some really kind of interesting call to actions. Yeah, and, and what I think uh, is important about her article that I think Moeller's article misses, really, is the statement and the conversation of the individual versus the collective. Yes. Uh, now, I'm not going to speak for all white people here, uh, but 
I'll speak for a lot of us. Uh, as white people, we have a propensity to think about the individual, right? Because everything out of the Enlightenment and which, from which modernity sprang and now kind of post-modernity in and of itself, there, there's such an emphasis on the individual inalienable rights that we all have, right? Like these negative rights that we all have independent of government that God has given us and the individual is the smallest minority that we need to protect. And all of those things are good. I affirm all of this, those things and they're all true. But where we kind of get tripped up sometimes is that when we want to have this conversation as white people about race we tend to look for these isolated incidents and events. And when we see less and less of them, right, we have a propensity to say, well, then systemic racism is not a problem because there's not these events mm. or these individual events that are occurring don't add up to an entire system, right? And so because racism tends to be a little bit more benign now in our systemic issues that we have, uh, and it's not like this outright, hey, black people can't vote or whatever, right? It's a little bit harder to find at times uh, if you don't know how to look for it. We run into this trap that I think Moeller runs into, but uh, Hammer does a great job of pointing out, is that yes, you know, the solution to racism is to help people change their hearts, and those are good things, and blah, blah, blah. But racism as a sin problem in the heart is a great thought, but it's an incomplete extrapolation of the thought. And I think this is her biggest strength that she brings to this article, is because when those things are not fully extrapolated to their logical conclusion, we miss out on the very real reality that people with that sin of racism in their heart become people who help build systems that continue to foster that iniquity towards people, right? And, and this is the biggest thing that we have to remember as you know, white people, particularly moving into this dialogue, is just like, yeah, there are systemic issues that we may not be aware of because we are tuned to think so hard to the level of the individual. And I think Hamron does a great job of calling us out of that individual lens hmm. uh, to look further at the collective one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That, that she definitely has some thought-provoking thoughts there. Do you, do you also see this as kind of a difference in perspective as to what the mission and the calling of the church out in society is? Specifically, and, and like I said, I can speak to this for my context, mm -hmm. a more fundamentalist context is going to be more prone to separate and say we need to save souls, not uh, stomachs. Yeah. Right? And so do you, do you see that kind of as an operating kind of under the current assumption here of what the calling of the church is. Yeah, and, and here's, here's my issue with that, right? And what I tend to see from our brothers and sisters who are on that side of like the souls versus stomach thing, I don't know how you can parse those things out. And I think Hamron kind of makes this point, like Jesus engaged with everybody right where they were all the time, right? When we look at the two feeding stories, particularly in Mark, right? In Mark 6 and in Mark 8, Jesus both feeds them, right? He nourishes their bodies physically, yeah. and then he also nourishes their spirits with teaching. There. So it, I don't understand how we kind of get into this either or dichotomy. It always feels like it's supposed to be a both and. Right. Because people can't hear you, hear what you have to say, if they can't hear you over their stomach, right? And people are going to be far more willing mm -hmm. to listen to you when their bellies are full. Definitely. Right? So I think it's just this important understanding that she brings to the surface uh, of how these conversations are longer, right? Yeah. It's just longer than a, you know, protesting for like a week and a half and being done with it. Right. Uh, these are generational conversations. These are huge issues that we need to really go after. Definitely, definitely. And I think where I see the pushback there from Moeller, uh, who's again representative of a more conservative evangelical perspective is, I don't want to feel like I have to forfeit the gospel right. for this sense of justice, mm -hmm. right? And I think what, what Hammerin is really saying is, no, 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 you don't give up your presuppositions about human soul and the human condition that yeah. can ultimately only be transformed by the gospel and the grace of, of Jesus Christ. Yeah. At the same time, that takes a body and a form and a shape and an action that compels us towards, you know, forth towards these issues. And so that, that's really interesting to see both of them kind of diverge on that. Mm -hmm. And we could probably see and different denominations yeah. or, yeah, or yeah. traditions come to mind yeah, for uh, sure. that hold these, these thoughts here. Yeah, well, and Dr. Hammerin actually also does that. She takes that first step by talking about how she only affirms traditional male and female marriage. And she comes under heavy fire in her article, right? right. Like all of the comments there uh, that are underneath it. Like the, a lot of the critiques that she takes is the, her view of, on sexuality and not even about what the main topic of her, you know, of her point was. Yeah. Kind of showing that the gospel is not about giving up your presuppositions, mm. but it's about realizing that the gospel is wider, right. most likely, than the presuppositions that we tend to think we That's might good. hold. What about on the other side? 
What, what, if, what if somebody came to us and said, hey, if you're not affirming some of these views, whether it's of sexuality or of social restoration, or whatever that may be, you're either with us or you're against us. Yeah. Do you feel like that challenge goes to the other side as well? Yeah, and I, I do think that that's where her article kind of has a propensity for weakness, right? Because it doesn't really talk about that. But she doesn't, I don't know that she's concerned with that reality, mm. right? Because it may be that we need to get to this Fund, pass this fundamental non-starter right. first before we worry about being kind of picked on Correct. for having these kind of beliefs that we do or don't have as, as people. Uh, and, and so uh, you will always, there will always be an inevitable divergence from you in the world, right? And that's what it means to be in and not of mm -hmm. in Romans 12, 1 and 2. And so I think what she's talking about is like, hey, we probably need to spend a little bit more time focusing on the in part before we even worry about having that conversation of feeling like we are of, as it were. Yeah. Good. Good stuff, man.